the Camp Rodney Seton Scout Naturalist Trail. A Seton Scout Naturalist Project, Summer 2018. Hello! Welcome, Welcome to the Seton Scout Naturalist Trail. This trail was created by the participants of the Seton Scout Naturalist Program. It is named after Ernest Thompson Seton, a founding pioneer of the Boy Scouts of America and an avid naturalist. The National Wildlife Federation's Conservation Hall of Fame states that Seton portrayed life as he saw it in bold living colors and words. He made the natural world come alive before the very eyes of millions. So come take a walk with us through the woods and see a small slice of all the wonders this trail has to offer. There are 20 posts along this two mile circuit trail. The trail begins behind the wilderness cabin. Follow the trail for about a mile until you get to stop 11. Then you'll turn left, go uphill and over Bull Mountain back towards the dining hall. Head on down the trail to your first stop. Hi, I'm Rohan. And I'm Matthew. And at Station 1, you can see the forest layers. Welcome to the forest, which is like a high-rise apartment building in New York City. Both the forest and the apartment building have many floors, or in the forest, lingo layers. Outside the ground floor of an apartment building, you can find much car traffic. On the forest floor, there is much animal traffic, including well camouflaged brown-colored chipmunks, wood thrushes. In the understory, you find trees that may reach the canopy if a space opens up and sunlight flows down. In the understory, you will find green colored vireos feeding on caterpillars and flycatchers catching flies. Tree trunks are like elevators, allowing squirrels to get from the ground floor to the canopy. In the canopy, if you look up and notice, you may see colorful scarlet tanagers feeding on caterpillars. People in the penthouse usually have much money. In the canopy, there is much sunlight and leaf growth taking place. After all, light is the currency of the forest. Hi, I'm Matthew again, and this is a sweet gum tree commonly found along the nature trail. As you walk along, see if you can find these leaves. It has star-shaped leaves and seed balls that disperse seeds in the wind. This tree is most common on Maryland's coastal plain. Hi, I'm Jacob. And I'm Caden. Look at the erosion on this nature trail. It is <coughs> this erosion is from water moving dirt or sediment downhill. A big cause of erosion is overgrazing from deer. As water washes downhill in the process of erosion, pollutants and fertilizer are picked up and flow into the Chesapeake Bay. This causes algae blooms, resulting in less oxygen in the water for fish and other marine life. On this trail, we can lessen the erosion by using fill dirt to fill in the gullies and install water bars to divert the water off of the trail. Hi, I'm Robert. And I'm Katie. White-tailed deer are herbivores, leisurely grazing on available plant foods and are most active at dawn and dusk. White-tailed deer are very abundant in this area and along the nature trail. This is due to many factors, including no natural predators and very limited hunting in this area. Some signs that deer in the area include rubbings where they've rubbed their antlers against the bark of a tree. In early autumn, the male deer, called bucks, may rub their antlers against the bark of a tree. He does this to remove the velvet covering that forms on the antlers. Bucks also ready themselves in the fall for the upcoming rut period by marking a territory and announcing their presence. Other signs of deer to watch out for include hoof prints in the mud and scat. If you remain quiet while continuing along the trail, you may see a deer. They can be quick 
and may dart across the path. Deer can sprint up to 30 miles per hour and can leap as high as 10 feet. Hi, Grayson here. This plant is Japanese stiltgrass. It is not native to the United States, but it is native to Southeast Asia. It can spread quickly by seeds, by either car tires or hiking boots. This is an annual grass, and you can see it has these lance-shaped leaves that alternate along the stem. But one of the most distinctive things is if you look at an individual leaf, it has this kind of silvery, lighter midrib going down the middle. And that's one of the things to look for to distinguish Japanese stilt grass. Japanese stilt grass can grow in many different soils after native plants have been removed due to logging or deer overgrazing. It is very common because most native animals do not feed on the plant. Japanese steel grass is here to stay. It would take an army of scouts to remove this plant by grabbing the plant and pulling it out of the ground. I'm Chris. And I'm Mitchell. The next stop is this chestnut oak tree that has split apart, possibly during a windstorm. The depression formed after the tree split apart formed a small pond which could host several species of native amphibians. Some species you may find breeding or living here are wood frogs, gray tree frogs, and salamanders. There are also some young green frogs, such as the ones filmed here on August 6, 2018, during our scout naturalist training. Fallen trees, also called wind throws, can also serve as highways for squirrels to travel on. Hi, my name is Bonnie. Hello, my name is Anthony. And this is a mountain laurel bush. Along this path, you will find mountain laurel bushes. This evergreen shrub, a heath prefers forest among chestnut oak trees on hillsides where the ground is acidic and well drained. These shrubs have white flowers with a unique pollination mechanism. Spring loaded anthers contain a pollen or tucked into the corolla of the flower. When a bee lands on a flower to gather nectar, the anther springs up and powders the bee with pollen that will be carried to another flower. When you hear a dry trill around the mountain laurel bushes, it will be a worm-eating warbler. The bird nests on the ground underneath the mountain laurel bushes. In late summer and early fall, unless you are very careful, you will likely walk into a spied microthena spiderweb. It is harmless and does not bite. The abdomen with 10 spines may make the spider less likely to be swallowed by birds. Hi, my name is Rohan and this is a pawpaw tree. These trees dominate the shrub layer of the Camp Rodney forest. Deer treat pawpaw leaves like many of you treat Brussels sprouts. They prefer to eat other plants. Deer prefer oak leaves, acorns, wildflowers, and other disappearing plants from the landscape. So pawpaw trees are becoming more common. However, did you know that pawpaw leaves are the only food source for the zebra swallowtail caterpillars? Hence, more pawpaw, more zebra swallowtails. Unfortunately, the Maryland butterfly, the Baltimore checker spot, used to be much more common around here. The turtle head flower, food for the checker spot caterpillars, is a favorite plant for deer. Due to the large population of deer, the checker spot is now an endangered species in Maryland. First, let's talk about why trees bend. There are two reasons. The first is soil creep. Soil creep is the movement of large pieces of soil over time, sometimes decades. 
The rate of movement of the soil is largely dependent on the type of soil, the amount of water, moisture that it retains, and the grade on which it's located. In the Grove of Eileen, we have Maryland Sassafras Loamy Chrome soil at about a 15 to 25 percent grade. As you can see, some of these trees have moved from their original locations. When the soil moves, it takes the base of the tree with it. The tree compensates for this uh, by a process known as phototropism. Phototropism allows the tree to move towards the light. Everything in the Grove of Eileen and in this forest is in a constant battle for the light of the precious canopy. This hickory has able to overcome, as you can see, significant challenges from moving from its original root spot and bending up towards the canopy light. Now, to talk about another curious resident of the Grove, I hand this over to Elijah. Hi, I'm Elijah. Look at these tiny holes in a row in the bark of this hickory tree. These holes are the work of the yellow-bellied sapsucker. These birds feed upon tree sap and bugs stuck to the sap, along with other fruits and nuts. This woodpecker is found across Canada and along the United States East Coast. They feature white chests, black wings, black and white striped heads, and red foreheads. Males are red-throated, females have a white throat. Sapsuckers are here at Camp Brownie in the winter time. You may hear them in the distance. They sound like this. Hi, Grayson here again. So this is a tulip poplar. This tree is actually in the magnolia family. The tree gets its name from the orange and green flowers that resemble tulips. The buds are flat and shaped like a duck's bill or a drum major's hat. The tulip poplar is one of the tallest of the Native American hardwoods and can reach 120 feet tall. Over time, as the tree grows, the lower branches where light has diminished, die, fall to the ground, rot, and add to the soil layer. The leaves look like a cat's face, or if you pull the top down, it looks like a canoe. Did you know Native Americans often used the lighter weight wood of tulip trees to make their dugout canoes? Baltimore Orioles often nest in tulip trees, especially if the trees are located near water. If you're lucky, you can find a lizard called a skink along the trail. Here at Rodney, there's three species, and each has its own niche. An ecological niche is the role and position a species has in its environment, how it meets its needs for food and shelter, how it survives, and how it reproduces. The larger of the skinks, the broad-headed skink, is arboreal, living high in the trees. They have been found in hawk nests. The most common five-lined skink lives in wooded areas, usually on the ground under rocks and rotting coarse woody debris. This is the common skink of backyards and porches. The little brown skink has golden to dark brown back. The little brown skink is primarily in pine and hardwood forests where they are found on the forest floor among and under rotting logs and leaf litter. They prefer moist places frequently occurring near streams. They seldom climb. When you're finished with station 11, make a left and head on up the hill to station 12. Poison Ivy is like the good Dr. Jekyll and the evil Mr. Hyde. The vine is good if you are a migrating yellow rumped warbler that feasts on its ivory colored berries during fall migration. There are also many other birds that feed on the berries. And now the evil Mr. Hyde. Poison ivy makes you itch. The toxic ingredient in poison ivy is an oily substance called uracil, which occurs in the sap and is present in all parts of the plant, including the rope-like vine with its clinging rootlets. 
The poison ivy vine is clinging to a white oak tree, which is the state tree of Maryland. Herds of deer roaming the forest will snap up most of the sweet-tasting acorns dropped by the white oak tree and leave very few acorns on the ground to germinate into new oak trees. After years go by, other trees, with seeds not preferred by deer, will replace the oak forest. Manage hunting to keep deer populations in check can enable the oak forest to thrive. White oak wood is a popular wood for flooring and furniture. It is also a good wood to burn in your wood stove to keep you warm in the winter. Oh my gosh, there's a pillion woodpecker flying across through the forest. A pileated woodpecker hammered with its sharp beak these square-shaped holes. Pileated woodpeckers drill larger round holes for its nest site. Other birds, such as bluebirds, chickadees, and tree swallows use abandoned woodpecker holes for their nest sites. Pileated woodpeckers have long barbed tongues to extract wood-boring beetle larvae, carpenter ants, or termites lying deep in the woods. This is a pig nut hickory. Hickories have feather compound leaves, large buds, and nuts encased in four parted husks. Squirrels bury the nuts, so they are the planters of hickory trees. Hickories grow slowly, have deep tap roots, and can live up to 300 years. The hickory horned devil, the caterpillar of the royal walnut moth, can sometimes be found gorging on hickory leaves. Hickory wood will keep you warm by the fireplace. It burns cleanly and produces the most heat of any eastern hardwood tree. The dense wood is used to make furniture, gun stocks, baseball bats, and in the past, carriage wheels and spokes. The smoke from burning hickory is used to flavor meat. This is a black birch tree. This is the tree you get birch beer from. The twigs of the black birch have a strong wintergreen smell. Please take only a small twig to smell and share with your scout group. We don't want the tree to look scraggly. Black birch is a beautiful tree with bark that is lustrous, smooth, and dark red on young trees, and black with loose, curled, scaly black plates on old trees. Black birch was once harvested to produce oil of wintergreen, until the 1950s and 60s when a synthetic oil of wintergreen appeared. The fermented sap is used to make birch beer. The wood of the black birch tree is hard and heavy. Deer do not tend to browse on black birch trees. That is one reason the trees will thrive at Camp Rodney, a place with a high deer population. Ouch! 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 This American holly tree is armored with prickly edged leaves that keep the deer away. Hollies are slow growing understory trees that can tolerate the shade of the trees above it. The red berries are fleshy fruit surrounded in a central seed or seeds. The whole berry is gulped down by animals and the fruity outer coat is digested. The seeds find their way out through the animal's digestive tract to be pooped out. If a seed lands in a sunny area, it may be eventually germinate and grow into a holly tree. Large migrating flocks of small birds such as cedar, waxwings, and American goldfinches can airlift the seeds to areas far from the tree. Holly branches are used for Christmas decorations. Behind post 17, you will see a swelling in the trunk of a black cherry tree. This is called a burl. It is caused by either injury, virus, or a fungus. Woodworkers can create some beautiful bowls made from cherry burls, as well as burls from other kinds of trees. Let's watch a bowl being made from a burl. This is a red maple. This is a red maple. In the dead of winter, the buds are red. With the springtime thaw, the red early blooming flowers appear to release pollen that is blown by the wind. The female flowers are then pollinated to form winged or helicopter seeds. In the summer, the leaf stems are red. Come autumn, the leaves are bright red. It takes 70 gallons of red maple sap to make a gallon of maple syrup. 
you will need only 35 gallons of sugar maple sap to make a gallon of maple syrup. Sometimes you will find what looks like red eyes on a red maple leaf. The eyes are actually galls with a fly larva inside. The galls are caused by a mosquito-like oscillate maple gall midge. Adult oscillate gall midges look very much like the boxwood leaf miner that you see here. In the spring, the midge emerges from the soil and lays its eggs on the undersides of maple leaves. At the center of each eye spot, a small translucent fly larva feeds. Hi, I'm Trisha. I'm Rob. What do you mean you created a time machine from a DeLorean? <laughs> <laughs> If your DeLorean landed a few miles north of here 18,000 years ago, you would have landed on top of a thick mass of ice. As the glaciers slowly melted, streams and rivers were created that flowed towards the coast. Sea levels rose and submerged the area that is now known as the Susquehanna River. This drowned river valley now contains the Chesapeake Bay. The upland gravels that make up the top of Bull Mountain were deposited here many years ago as sediments washed down the Susquehanna River Valley. These gravels are more resistant to erosion than the rocks in lower lying nearby areas. Camp Romney is on the coastal plain that extends westward from the continental shelf to a fall line that ranges from 15 to 90 miles west of the bay. During the 17 and 1800s, Cities like Baltimore and Washington, D.C. grew along the fall line to take advantage of potential water power generated by the falls. These cities became important areas for commerce as colonial ships could not sail past the fall line and had to stop to transfer their cargo to canals or overland shipping. Rocks in the more hilly Piedmont area, west of the fall line, are mostly metamorphic and more resistant to eroding away. What's up with this bark? It looks like it's melting. It's called smooth patch. This saprophytic fungi actually colonizes and decomposes the corky, dead outer layers of bark on living trees. The tiny saucer-shaped mushrooms are pale brown and often appear near the borders of the smooth patches. Smooth patch is a parasite sticking to the outside bark of the trees it infests. However, it does not seriously threaten the health of the host oak tree.